Okay. I'll go ahead and get started then. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the session. Uh, <clears throat> fully aware that this is the after lunch zone out digestion time, so uh, apologize for that. I will try to be engaging. Um, I've sprinkled in what I think are a few jokes in the uh, in the presentation. They might not be. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but welcome. I'm glad you all came here. Um, this is my first time back to Drupal Camp in a couple years. I feel like I was here maybe in 2018 or 19. Um, I've been away from the from the scene for a little bit, but I'm happy to be back here and uh, and running uh, doing another presentation. It's uh, it's good to be back. Um, so this is uh, the session is should we decouple? If this is not the session you were expecting, I recommend sticking around because it might be interesting. Um, this is going to be just a, an informal conversation about uh, website architecture. Um, there is no code. This is actually the first presentation I've done in a long time that contains zero code. So if you are not a developer, fantastic. You're not going to see any code on this presentation. Uh, this is more just talking about things that you should probably consider as you're looking to switch over an architecture to uh, uh, a decoupled type of architecture. So let's go ahead and get started. Who am I? So my name is Tom Mount. I'm a senior solutions engineer at a company called Edgeo. Uh, those of you who have been around on internet technologies for a while might recognize the company name Limelight. Um, it's a video distribution platform. Uh, if you watch ESPN or Disney or Amazon, uh, probably your shows have passed through our servers at some point. Um, I won't give you a, a completely detailed history of the company because in the last two years it's been quite a roller coaster of acquisitions and name changes and everything else. Uh, suffice to say, Edgeo right now works in the CDN space for web applications, so we offer hosting for Jamstack applications, JavaScript, um, so React applications, Next, Nuxt, Node, all that fun stuff. I'm a, I'm a sales engineer there, solutions engineer. Um, I've been in the industry for about 20 odd years. Um, a lot of that time has been in web development, um, and a lot of that time has been in the Philadelphia area. So I worked at Eastern Standard, um, development agency in Philadelphia for a while. Uh, worked at eBay Enterprise and King of Prussia for a bit. Um, and now I work out of my house in, in Delaware. Um, Edgeo is a distributed company, pretty pretty remote company. Uh, we got people all over the place. And uh, right now my office and my home are kind of the same spot. So I've uh, been working there for about a year and a half. Really enjoy it, uh, despite some early misgivings. Um, was uh, never worked in pre-sales before. So had a lot of uh, a lot of new ways of doing things that I had to figure out and, and get, get settled on. But uh, I'm really enjoying it right now. Um, a lot of fun stuff that I'm getting involved with. A lot of cool clients that I'm meeting. Uh, so, really fun. This is not going to be a sales pitch for Edgeo, by the way. This just happens to be the space that I play in. Uh, and I want you to know my background, um, mostly in development. Um, so, it's a little bit about me. What are we going to cover today? So, I want to talk about things that I am not going to necessarily do. I'm not going to tell you to make a specific decision about your website architecture. Uh, I don't think that's my place. I don't know your business. I don't know your teams. I don't really know what you are into, and so I can't really make that call for you. I'm not going to tell you that one way of doing it is better than another. Um, that is, again, not really my position. What I, I'm not even going to turn into a pros and a cons list. This is not going to be, you know, the pros and the cons of decoupling or not decoupling. That's this is mostly going to be really just a way of raising some questions. Uh, some of these questions, I'll be perfectly honest. You may get to the end of this presentation and be like, well, that was a waste. I already know all, all those questions. I've already answered all those. And that's great. Look, I, I don't have all the answers. I don't even think I have all the questions. I don't know if anybody really does. But in my time in professional services and now in the pre-sales world, I've seen a lot of things that people do. Um, they, they make decisions without having all the facts, or they don't really consider all of the ramifications of those decisions. And so I want to help you make a more informed decision, maybe put a little bit of light on some overlooked things that you might have missed um, or that you might not have completely thought about so that you can take some action now and present your, uh, prevent some, some challenges down the road. But before I start, I want to make sure I, I do this a lot. I'm a technical guy. I'm a developer. I start using terms that I think everybody knows because everybody's had 20 years of software development experience, right? So I want to cover some definitions first. The first one I want to talk about is the word headless. So I'm going to try not to say this word. I may slip up. My colleagues in sales say this all the time. I don't like this word. I think it's not really precise. And I'm an engineer. I like precision. So I'm not going to say this word as much as possible, but it may slip in. Um, 
If it does slip in, know that I'm talking about sites that are decoupled. These are words that I actually will use pretty often. Before I get into what decoupled means, though, I do want to talk about front end and back end. Uh, if you are a prospective job seeking web developer and you've ever sat in an interview and somebody's like, So, are you a front end dev or a back end dev? Anybody have that experience? That's happened to me a lot. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what is the correct answer to that question, by the way? Both. Do both. Do both. Full stack, right? I pulled that off in a, in a meeting sometimes. Somebody asked me, Oh, you've you got dev experience. What's your background? Fr front end or back end? I'm like, Ah, full stack. And the guy just started laughing because he, that's what we call ourselves. If we don't really know what to call ourselves, right? So, what am I going to refer to when I talk about front end or back end? Really, I'm going to call this, this is just a shorthand way of separating the interactive, the presentation layer, that's your front end, from everything else that's in your stack, that's your back end. That is not the canonical definition, all right? But don't go and be like, guy at Drupal Camp said this is what this means. And then this is just how I'm using these words today. There's a lot of shades of nuance. People define it differently. It's totally okay. I don't really, it doesn't bother me. I just want to make sure that, like, as I'm using these terms, when I talk about front end and back end, front end is the presentation layer, that's the part that people see, and the back end is what generates that part that people see. So, with that in mind, decoupling, coupled or decoupled. These talk about how much the back end of the website is involved in sending content to the front end of the website. And really, there's three kind of shades of decoupled architecture. So the first one is a tightly coupled. That's the phrase that people use. In this one, this is where the back end handles all of the response content. So you make a request, you get all of the content back at one shot, and it all comes from your back end system. The same one that's handling your CMS, where your content's coming from, is also displaying the information that you need. Partially or progressively decoupled, this is super popular. This is actually pretty common in the Drupal space, especially, because um, Drupal makes this relatively easy. This is where the back end still does send over some of the HTML content necessary to display what your users see, but it doesn't send all of it. Usually it sends over kind of a stub or a skeleton, uh, and then pieces of JavaScript on the page will go fetch API content from somewhere. It could be that same back end, it could be elsewhere, uh, and then we'll display that content. When people say partially or progressively decoupled, this is usually what they're referring to. There is another means of doing this. This is fully decoupled. This is going all in on, this is like, when people talk about headless, usually it's shorthand for fully decoupled. This is where the back end really is not doing anything, like Drupal in this case is not really doing anything except actually sending the content, the API data, that the page needs to, to load and to render properly. All of the actual HTML, that skeleton that we talk about that gets populated with content, that's all coming from someplace completely different from usually a JavaScript library or a framework. So here we're talking things like React or Next or Vue or something like that. So as I talk about headless, coupled, decoupled, I will try to make sure that I tell you which version of decoupled if, if there are differences uh, so that there's not any confusion. Let's contextualize this a little bit as far as Drupal is concerned because this is a Drupal camp. Probably most people in here are familiar with how Drupal is set up and how it handles requests and responses. Out of the box, all the versions of Drupal that you use, if you just do a basic installation and load the page up, those are gonna be what we consider tightly coupled. So all the menus, the blocks, the views, everything like that is all being sent as one big chunk of response. Now, back in, I wanna say it was DrupalCon 2018 in Nashville. Could be wrong. Um, there was a uh, there was a, a, a Dries note, I think it was, where he started talking about how they wanted to integrate some React components into Drupal's admin and start kind of dog fooding that for a potential future release. Unfortunately, that didn't really go anywhere. Uh, it took a long time. There was a lot of work put into that, a lot of challenges. And I'm not saying because the Drupal team couldn't do it, neither can you. Please don't <laughs> don't read that in there. Um, they had some very specific challenges that they were dealing with that not everybody is going to. But they were experimenting with kind of this partially decoupled, this progressively decoupled admin thing, where they would still send HTML responses back from within Drupal, but then a React application or some other front-end application would pick up the rest of the content and display settings and forms and, and things like that. It would be more reactive and more responsive to, to user input. That would have been a partially decoupled thing. So if you're familiar with that process, that's, that's kind of what they've done. I, Nobody, no official Drupal release has really ever done anything fully decoupled. 
but it certainly is possible. Um, in a fully decoupled Drupal architecture, essentially you have Drupal running as really just your backend source of truth. That's where you keep all your content, your images, your links. Uh, you're probably not really building out blocks particularly, or menus or things, uh, menus you might a little bit. Um, but you have a separate application that's built in React or in Vue, and that's actually contacting Drupal via an API calls, it's using the JSON API maybe, uh, and pulling content that you want to display on a page and sending it up that way. So just a, just a really quick go over you know, what, what those decoupled architectures might look like in a kind of a Drupal context. There are still a few more definitions I want to cover. I'm just going to hit these real quick. Um, if I start talking about frameworks, know that what I'm talking about there is a, just a collection of JavaScript classes, methods, uh, provide a standardized way of writing web components. Um, so you might hear things like React or Svelte or Vue. These are all basic frameworks that allow you to write these components. They generally don't, on their own, have really robust routing and middleware solutions. They might not even have any. And that's where the next one comes in. I don't know if this is an official term or if I just made this up. I feel like I read it somewhere. I thought that makes a lot of sense. A meta framework. It's a framework for your framework, right? So again, JavaScript classes and methods, but now we're building in some of this routing and some of this request handling. So if you have React as your framework, you might have a Next.js meta framework. I mean, they'll call themselves a framework, and it really is, but it's a framework for React. Uh, Svelte Kit. Right? If you're using Svelte, but you want something that's a little bit more robust in handling requests, you might use Svelte Kit. If you like Vue, like I do, Vue is my favorite, I love Vue, um, you might want to use Nuxt. Right? That's the, the, the framework for Vue. I'll be honest, I probably won't say meta framework all that often. I just wanted to get this out here. Right? Now that it's out there, it's public. Uh, it's a thing. I'll take credit for it. Um, one other word you might hear me use a little bit later, uh, monolith. So. Monolithic architecture, you don't run into this a whole lot anymore. You might still. This is where literally everything runs on a single stack. So you've got your server that's running on like DigitalOcean or Rackspace or somewhere, and your PHP, your database, your Apache, your Nginx, um, your Redis. It's all running on a single system. Um, again, you don't really come across this very often. A lot of the major hosting part platforms have kind of moved to a containerized architecture where you're not having that single point of failure where if your server, the server, goes down, your entire site goes offline. Uh, so you still come across this occasionally, but usually now, even if they're not using containers, a lot of people use like on AWS, they'll have S3 for storage, they'll have RDS for database, they'll have EC2 for the actual you know, applications that are running. They'll break that up a little bit. So I may use this word. Um, I'm pretty sure I found it in the slide a little bit later on, so I came back and put a definition on it. So, with those definitions in mind, let's actually talk about some of the questions. I kind of broke this down into a couple of different groups. Business concerns, um, personnel concerns, and then, honestly, other. I was really racking my brain to find a good heading for it. I couldn't come up with anything. But there are a lot of business questions, right? The who's, the what's, the why's, the when's, the how's. Um, I want to highlight, there was a, a really good article that Pantheon put out um, a week or two ago, I think it was an interview with the agency, Molly Dugan, um, and she made the point that before they start any new project, they have to ask questions like, what are you trying to accomplish? What pain points are you trying to solve? How will you deliver a better customer experience? How fast does the project need to be done? Uh, I didn't crib all of these questions from here. I, I promise that I thought of some of these questions as well before I dug into this, but I really love the way that she basically just collapses into one single paragraph. These are a lot of concerns that the business stakeholders need to ask before they make any decision about the new architecture of a new website. So let's start at the top. What are the pain points you're trying to solve? Um, will this decoupled architecture that you're investigating, will that actually solve those pain points? So some of these pain points, and these are, by no means are an exhaustive list, but some of these pain points might include the actual speed of the site. The agility, how fast can you turn around a new release of your website? How long does it take you to push something out into production? Low or lost revenue. Um, this is a great place to, to introduce the, the concept of the five whys. I don't know if you've heard of this before, but it's, it's, it's a really simple but powerful way of, of analyzing these kinds of questions. Just keep asking why. Um, so for instance, let's say that you think your website is slow and you want to make an architectural change to make it faster. Well, why is it slow? And why is that a business problem? 
Um, I will say that, you know, if you're thinking like my problem is that I don't have as much revenue on my e-commerce site, um, it could actually be a speed question. Um, most people, they've, they've done studies on this. For every second that somebody bails early on a website, you lose that much more revenue. So uh, it could be, for instance, or they, for every second, I'm sorry, for every second that the page takes to load, people actually will leave sooner and sooner. So you might have, if you shave one second off of your website, you might retain five, six, seven percent more visitors to your site. Uh, if you shave two seconds off, now you're at 15 percent visitors will actually stay on your site as opposed to bouncing off. And that can affect your bottom line and your revenue. So if the question is, we need to redo our site, why do you need to redo it? Is it slow? Are you having some revenue issues? Are you not able to push out things into production faster? And do you think that making a architectural change will actually address these issues, or is that going to be just something that adds complexity later on? Again, I'm not going to give you the answer because I don't actually have answers here. But these are questions that I think are very important to, to talk about. The amount of times that I've seen people like, well, we have a slow website, so we're going we're gonna to build a React website slower than the site that they were trying to replace it with, right? Because they were not answering the correct question. They were not focusing on the right issue. Maybe they didn't have, and we'll get into some of the other reasons for why that might be. But uh, don't just assume that an architectural change in any direction is going to automatically make your site faster or more agile uh, or is going to increase revenue. What business goals are you aligning to? And is the decoupled architecture the best way to align to those goals? So I will say that you know business, the, the decoupled architecture in some fashion, whether it's progressive or completely decoupled, is really probably a, a, usually a good fit for e-commerce sites. So if you're running a storefront, for instance, and you're making a lot of calls to a back-end database to give you products and inventory and pricing and reviews, you can see a performance benefit uh, and even an agility benefit from switching over to a more decoupled architecture. But if you're running kind of a static site, kind of a marketing site, that might actually not be a, a good fit. You might actually end up with a worse off site or a worse off experience for your developers or your users as a result of making that change. So you kind of have to consider what the business's goals are for the site. Okay, apologies for that. Technology, right? Um, so decoupled architectures tend to be decent fits for e-commerce, may not necessarily be decent fits for uh, marketing, brochureware, static kind of sites. Um, and the other question is how many sites are you transitioning? So um, in my agency days, I worked with the University of Pennsylvania for a while. They had several hundred web properties that all had to share the same kind of design standard, design pattern. Uh, and so the agency that I was with, we, I don't think we actually went uh, with a decoupled route, but we definitely considered it for this case because it made it a lot easier to share components and uh, design artifacts, bits of menu or headers or site layouts. Uh, made it easy to share between you know a couple hundred properties that we were doing. If you have one site that you're working on, or two maybe, uh, then maybe you're not going to see as much benefit from having that super decoupled, componentized way of looking at it. <clears throat> Another thing that I see that really has bitten a lot of my prospects and my clients in the past is this question of ownership and governance for the site. So who owns creating new content or updating content on the site? In a larger, more enterprise-type organization where you have a marketing team, um, you're going to end up with uh, kind of a, a bigger break between the marketing and the developer workflow. So if you have a normal Drupal, fully coupled, tightly coupled site, um, a lot of times anybody that has access to Drupal can make pretty substantial changes to the layout and the framework and the organization of the page, more than just, beyond just content. Less the case the more you decouple the site, uh, in fact, there was one prospect that I worked with that had, um, they fully decoupled their site and then they realized that marketing could no longer make any changes to the presentation of the site and had to go through the development team and it actually added a week's worth of time on their part because now they actually had to reach out to a developer to make all the changes that they used to be able to make themselves. You can get around that with some creative site building and some you know clever work in the CMS, but if you don't think about that, you might find yourself, when it's time to roll out a new change to your site, all of a sudden your, your marketing team is screaming because they, don't, they can't make the change anymore. I would recommend 
that as you're making this choice, if you come up with a decision that, hey, maybe this would change our marketing and our development workflows, get somebody from marketing, from somebody from development in the room with you while you're making these decisions. Uh, again, I'm not saying that you can't make it a certain decision because that would cut somebody out, but they should be informed and they probably ought to be in the room. The other thing that I get, I see a lot is the timeline, right? We, we all understand the project management issues of on time, correct, and within budget, and you pick two, right? That's, that's the usual, the, the conventional wisdom. I'm gonna tell you right now, it's always gonna take a little bit longer than you think to overhaul the architecture on your site. Plan for it to take longer. Um, one good strategy for something like this is to kind of make it an incremental rollout of the new site. Very few people want to push the big red button and relaunch their site all at once. That was a thing, like five years ago. And I remember, again, agency days, buying a stack of pizzas and a case of beer for the dev team, and hey, it's Friday night, time to launch this site. And we're there for eight hours, um, you know, doing a complete rollover. Very few people want to incur that anymore. Uh, what I'm seeing right now in the industry is a lot of people really like the ability to just transition one page at a time, one section of the site at a time. Uh, I'm working with a number of different agency clients on really both sides of the Atlantic, and they're dealing with this exact same thing, is the ability to progressively relaunch a site. Um, I will say the company that I work for has tools that make this super easy. Um, you just point the DNS, you set up the rules, all traffic goes to the current, soon to be legacy site, and then you take, you know, I want these paths and all of their assets to go over to the new site. Let me test, let me collect data. Like, all right, this looks good. Traffic is good, site looks good. Send more pages over this way. That is usually the way that a lot of people wanna do it, and being able to kind of progressively decouple allows you to do this a little bit faster. I'm not saying that you have to decouple in order to do this. You can stick with a tightly coupled architecture and make this change. It's mostly just a matter of, you know, DNS and routing and all that fun stuff. But Having a decoupled architecture really makes a lot of sense because it allows you to quickly kind of pivot and make some changes that won't really affect, um, you know, won't have unintended side effects as you make these changes. And I think probably a huge concern that needs to be addressed on the business side is how will you know if this has been a success? This is something that you need to plan for. So I think probably anyone who's done project management in here now we know what KPIs are, right? Key performance indicators. Um, establish some metrics by which you know that you are being successful as you are working on this project. Remember, be smart about it. And by smart, I'm talking about specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time-boxed goals, right? Don't just like, we're gonna increase revenue. That's not a KPI, right? KPI is that we're gonna see specific, we're gonna see, you know, additional, um, uh, additional purchases, we're going to see 30% because it's measurable, we're going to see a 10%, 20% increase in purchases. Uh, is it achievable? We're going to see a 90% increase in sales. Are you though? Right? Is that achievable? That's, that's a stretch goal. Um, is it relevant? Right? If, if you're a company that is uh, primarily brochure or uh, you know, marketing, you're not actually selling anything, please don't make one of your KPIs that you're going to increase your revenue. Not selling anything on your website. That's not really achievable. It's not really relevant to what you're doing. And then time boxed. You know, are you going to increase at 20% in the next week? 20% over the next six months? What's the, how are you going to do this? So those KPIs need to be very specific, but they also need to be things that you can do, that you can measure. Uh, and then you're going to want to make sure that you <clears throat> document your data collection methods and probably take some baseline readings too, right? Because if you don't know where you're coming from, how are you going to know when you've gotten to where you want to be, right? So before you even start this project, what you probably ought to do is take some measurements, you know, establish your KPIs, figure out where you are now, you know, what is my current revenue from the site? What is my current bounce rate? And then how am I measuring that now so that when I turn around on the new site, I'm gonna use the same measurement methods, uh, I'm gonna measure the same thing, I'm gonna measure the same, you know, whatever data is coming in from my website, so that I know for sure that, uh, that we've met the goal. And that just comes down to kind of data science almost, right? Like designing a good experiment, making sure that you have good testing methodologies. So those are business concerns. Um, we can talk about team concerns as well. So these are things, this is all about the who's. Now I, I don't necessarily, I didn't take 
notes and specifically get this quote, but something interesting as I was just chatting uh, off to the side with one of my prospects, said so that, uh, uh, again, I'm paraphrasing. It's like, now we have to go out and hire a new set of front-end devs because we decided to decouple, and, and it's easier to hire React devs than it is to find new devs, so we're probably going to have to use React for the new site. Um, you see how that one decision kind of snowballed down the lines. Like, well, we chose to do this, but we decided that we didn't actually have the team to be able to do it, so now we've got to go hire more front-end devs to do this. And because it's easier to hire front-end devs that know this framework as opposed to that framework, that kind of made the decision for which framework we're going to have to go for. So that's something that you, you know, as you make this decision and start this journey, just bear in mind, right? Do you have developers that have experienced writing in this before? And this is pretty critical. Um, I'm not, look, I, I spent almost all my days now working in JavaScript, um, whether that's presentation layer JavaScript or writing node applications on the back end or things like that. So I'm, I'm not bagging on front end developers. I love front end devs. That was not what I started out as. That's kind of what I've worked on here. I still hate CSS, so don't, don't hate me for that. But look, the, the, the point is that those decoupled JavaScript applications are generally a little bit more complicated than just buying something out of the box. For instance, just running a Drupal site. Um, it does require a little bit more understanding of the actual request lifecycle. So what happens between the point when the person clicks on a link and then actually gets that content back. The developer in charge of this application probably needs to have a little bit more awareness of what's going on behind the scenes when that happens. My recommendation for taking this kind of piece by piece and taking it slow is to actually start out small. Uh, if you want to do a partially decoupled architecture, that's great. Make a little like a POC site or a demo site. Um, if you want to put some less trafficked pages on your production site on this, um, put it in a pre-production environment, but keep a short feedback loop, I think is the point. No matter how you do it, make sure you keep that feedback loop really short and tight with the team that's doing the development so that anything that they run into, any issues that they have, whether that's technical issues of, I don't know how to do this, or it's issues of, we just don't know how this framework actually handles these kinds of requests. Um, and I will say, like, just because somebody maybe necessarily understands how those requests get processed via a PHP Symphony app for Drupal, you know, React is going to handle a little bit differently, and Vue is going to handle a little differently from React even. So there's nuances to the framework that you choose and how these things are handled, and you're going to want to make sure that your developer team understands that you know they have that short cycle to to give that feedback. Um, do they have experience writing in that very specific framework? Um, look, just because somebody can write JavaScript doesn't mean that they can write an Angular application. Doesn't mean they can't learn, and certainly they will. Most developers tend to be fairly motivated to learn new things, and so that's totally fine. But you do have to make sure that somebody on the team has experience doing this if you want to do it quickly. If you want to make it a learning experience and bring in some folks and you know slowly work your way up, that is also perfectly legit. Um, I would also consider the possibility, if you, especially if you're starting out, have a small dev team, not sure if you've got the people to necessarily make this, but also don't want to go out and hire a bunch of new people, maybe consider staff augmentation. So um, there are certainly agencies and even some hosting providers have professional services where they will actually basically loan out one, two, three developers, project manager, whatever you need to build out your staff. And they will function as a member of your team for whatever time you specify. And they can bring that experience into your team. And a good augmentation program will not only help you actually build the site, but also up-level the developers who are working with them so that um, once this site is done and launched and ready to roll, that this team now has the capacity to take over the ownership and the maintenance and the ongoing feature development for the site. Which kind of leads me into the next question of how big is the front-end team? So um, I started thinking, you know, in my days as a Drupal developer working just on the front end of sites, you know, a front end dev and a, and a really tightly coupled Drupal stack. Um, they're probably focusing primarily on the presentation of the site, probably not doing a whole lot of site building. They may do a little bit of like pipelining for if they have like JavaScript widgets or something, but they're probably focusing primarily on the presentation. If you switch over to a partially decoupled stack, the pressures on them might increase to all of that, plus maybe doing some more build pipeline stuff specifically. Like now you have to have a build pipeline for your assets because you can't run just JavaScript 
stuff, generally speaking, you can't just run any of these frameworks just bare in a browser. They need to be compiled, they need to be deployed. If you're going to go fully decoupled, you still have to do all of that. But now you probably also have to handle routing. Because remember, Drupal is no longer handling the requests as they come in. It's something else completely different. So now you have to add that onto the stack. And again, not bagging on front end devs. Like, I, I wouldn't call myself one because I'm not good enough at it. But I definitely have spent a lot of time working on it. Um, just know that the more you decouple, the more responsibility you're probably putting on them to do that. Now, if you have a large enough team, this might not be a problem. If you have a large enough team that also includes some people who are pretty handy on the back end, it might also not be a problem because some of that responsibility could shift over to them. And truth be known, look, I mean, gone are the days where back end developers only ever wrote PHP and Java, right? Node as a back end language is pretty common, so probably a lot of your back end developers also know JavaScript. Again, communication is going to be key. Just make sure that everybody understands you know, lanes, lanes of responsibility. And once again, of course, obviously, if the people who are going to be the work, be doing the work, need to be in the room as decisions are being made so that they can give their feedback and talk about, you know, what they're running into. The last one I want to get into is this kind of a technology ecosystem, this nebulous other, I wasn't really sure what to call it. Um, Kingfisher is a UK-based company. They are basically the UK equivalent of like Lowe's, Home Depot, that sort of thing, home improvement chain. Uh, Dave Charles is one of their architects over there. He wrote a great article on Medium about their uh, journey towards a more modern stack for their website. Uh, and he said, our modernization isn't just a refactoring of the tech stack. If we were to continue to do things in the same way as before, there'd be a reasonable chance we'd end up back where we are today. So the background there is that they did build this highly modern decoupled stack, and it was great for like two years. And then it got started to get slower and started to bring, bring in some more challenges. And they realized that they didn't actually change any of the ways that they did development or that they approached feature releases on their site. And as a result, they weren't able to actually see as much benefit from this change as they would have if they had taken a more holistic view of their entire process. So, Let's dig into that a little bit. Ask yourself, what about our culture may need to change as a result of choosing this decoupling strategy? Well, the first thing, obviously, to look at is going to be your dev and deployment processes, right? Uh, because it's very different depending on if you're doing a tightly coupled versus really any kind of decoupled architecture. Um, just the fact that you have a build pipeline now is probably a substantial change that you didn't have when you were having just a bare bones Drupal site. If you don't change those processes, if you don't look at them at least, uh, you do run the risk of limiting the effectiveness of what you're gonna be doing. So make sure that as you're evaluating these solutions that you're also looking for um, what processes may need to change as a result of this. Um, I would say map those existing processes if you haven't already. Uh, look for improvements, areas to improve, as well as architectural improvements. What part of your data model might need to change? So this is, Maybe something that isn't immediately obvious. Um, I mean, the first question is, if you're using Drupal, is that JSON API really going to be able to serve all the content that you need? Answer, eh, probably, yeah. But is it going to be in a way that you can easily take advantage of it? And I ask that because a lot of times there may be interdependencies between different types of content within Drupal. And you need to make sure that as you're getting your API structured and ready to go, that you're taking into account some of those interdependencies. Um, hosting. Do we need to reevaluate hosting partners and costs? Uh, this can be a little touchy um, because this really starts to add some complexity. So not all hosting solutions for your Drupal site are going to support all models of decoupled architecture. Uh, some of them may support partially decoupled, but not fully. Some of them may support fully. Some of them may not really support much of anything except just the PHP-based stuff. Uh, and as a result of that, you may need to change or at least supplement your hosting partner if you are looking to do this, to do this work. Um, I sometimes come onto this from the opposite direction. I get this from some of my prospects of, hey, we're going to go do a decoupled site. Um, can you host our database? I'm like, mm, sorry, we, we, just, we just do the JavaScript portion of this. I'm like, oh, you mean we're going to have to use you and somebody else? We're going to have to keep our AWS account? That may be something that you need to investigate. And uh, if that's going to be a huge thing where you don't want to have multiple vendors supporting your web stack at once, then you may need to evaluate what vendors will support everything all at once. Some things that might 
come as a result of a changed or supplement host partner? Obviously, the cost is probably going to be different. Um, I don't think you're going to get the same cost from two different vendors. Uh, they may have different support structures. So if you're used to being able to call up a phone number, maybe the vendors that you're evaluating don't actually have phone support. Um, maybe they have Slack support. You've never used that before. Um, this is a big one that a lot of people get very hesitant around. Um, if you change, you might have to do a DNS change as well. Uh, and that brings into play a whole lot of scheduling things. You know, you have to, hopefully nothing will go down, but you know, DNS is DNS. And you can take all the precautions in the world, but if somebody misspells something as they're copying and pasting, uh, you know, or they forget to add a host name to a configuration, it can take a little while to track down and you might, your site might go offline. So you need to be prepared for potential DNS changes. Uh, make sure that you have plans in place and you've gone over with your new hosting partner how you're going to handle this, this uh, DNS change that you're doing. I will say this, pretty much anybody that runs Drupal today will support, without question, a partially decoupled architecture. And that's because in a partially decoupled world, Drupal is still the one doing the response handling. It's still doing the routing. It's still sending back that HTML. And then you're just loading up your React application, or your view application after the page loads and pulling in your content. So right now, if, you're, if you have a tightly coupled Drupal site and you are considering moving to a decoupled architecture, you can do that probably without changing. Uh, if you go for a, at least a partially decoupled or a progressively decoupled site. If you want to go to a fully decoupled site, well, then you might, this is where you might need to ask the question of like, okay, who are we going to actually choose to host this? Because not all hosting partners will do fully decoupled. Security is a big thing. Is our security footprint going to change? Well, I can say this. Yes, it, it will change. <laughs> if you change your decoupling architecture, it will change. But how will it change, right? So you're introducing new API routes, which means that now you have new potential ways into or out of your application that you did not have before because you were just sending basic HTML across the line. With these new security holes, you might open yourself up to things like scraping attacks. This is where somebody runs a bot net and actually pulls content off of your site and then hosts it themselves because they want to basically be your site or pretend to be your site and pull your customers away and get the money themselves. Uh, this could also lead to things like phishing or proxy attacks where somebody masquerades as your site. And any of these things could eventually lead to things like brand damage. Um, I think we're all aware of the brand damage in the news of people pretending to be other people on Twitter in the last couple of months, right? That is a big deal. And so as you investigate adding API routes into your application, definitely be on the lookout for security footprint changes. Investigate things like using a WAF. Uh, don't just rely on Drupal's own security. Make sure that you have a web application firewall sitting in front of your site to block things like directed phishing attacks or SQL injection attacks. I would also really recommend that you look into bot management or bot mitigation uh, because that's going to stop down all of those attempts to scrape your content and pull content out in an automated sort of way. If you can catch those bots and stop them from doing that, you greatly reduce the risk of having these scraping or these proxy attacks going on. And I would ask your vendor, do you have a WAF solution in place? Do you have bot management? Do you have bot mitigation in place? Um, if they don't, as a first party solution, do they support you bringing it on as kind of a third party solution, adding it into the stack? Uh, but you should always make sure that you account for having a WAF and or a bot management solution in place. Uh, do we have the, the testing and the debugging bandwidth to support this change? Adobe put out a white paper not too long ago. Uh, where I mean, they were, they were pushing for their decoupled e-commerce solution, and they flat out said that adding layers to your e-commerce environment can increase the time and skill sets required to identify the root cause of an issue and to troubleshoot it. Um, you can think of this as like the second law of thermodynamics for websites, right? Uh, everything will proceed towards a more disordered state, and <laughs> that includes websites, as they go and they spend more time and get more data accumulated in the database, uh, more people touching it, different code styles being pushed. Um, your website will grow in complexity, and uh, especially if you change, e change architectures, you can expect a different kind of complexity. What I would recommend is that you begin working your tests into your process early on. Get a good foundation of unit testing, of end-to-end -end testing, of uh, integrated testing. Get that in there early, and then choose a standard library and a methodology. Make sure your development team is, is prepped on that, and they know how to run those tests. And make sure those tests run every time somebody commits code and pushes a new version of the site out. That will not solve the issue of 
complexity, but it will greatly reduce the number of times that you have to dig into the code and try to do some troubleshooting on it. So I want to wrap up. We have uh, four or five minutes here. Um, should we decouple our sites? Yeah, you should totally consider it. I'm not going to say yes or no. You're not going to get an answer out of me on this one. But you should totally consider it. But you should also set yourself up for success if you choose to decouple. So to summarize, right, know where you are now. Identify where you want to go. Uh, document how you're going to get there. Make sure that your contributors to your site, your marketing team, your development team, your business stakeholders, make sure they all have a seat at the table, get their feedback early and often throughout this process. Identify any hidden costs that might be around hosting, support, staffing before you start, lest you get six months into your project, run out of money, and figure, well, now we got to do something, and you end up paying through the nose for something that you could have adjusted for earlier in the project. And finally, choose a technology partner that has the experience building these applications uh, that can help guide you and your team. And that doesn't necessarily mean go out and find a professional services team or agency to do this for you. It just means make sure that you have people that are, even if it's a support team from the hosting company that you're at, make sure that you have somebody around you that you can look to for help um, that isn't Stack Overflow. Although, let's be honest, Stack Overflow is great. A uh, couple sources here. The notes are available online. You can get these, these links here. Um, uh, some special thanks to some folks on my team, Juan Pineda, Chris Farrell, uh, Will Rowe for some of their anecdotes and pointers as I went through this. Um, and I guess that's it. I will open up for questions if anybody's got some. Who wants to be first? Yes? Um, can you give examples that you've seen in the wild where information architecture was a big impact on this decision? Uh, at our university, we have some centers that have used Drupal in a creative way where they use it as an intricate database, and there's really uh, a lot of hesitancy of reconsidering all of those interlocking references. So just any type of example where you've had to make that decision of, well, maybe we should decouple if you're not going to readjust how you've built this database Drupal. Yeah, no, that's a, so the question for, for the purposes of recording, um, any examples of times when information architecture um, really was one of the decision makers for making an architectural change? Uh, it's funny, you did I, did I summarize that question? Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Um, yeah, actually, so I was just talking with uh, one of my prospects over in Germany yesterday. Uh, yesterday? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yesterday. And um, they, had this, they had this problem. They had, exactly like you said, they had a CMS that was kind of creatively set up. It was already very tightly tied to a component library that they had built. Uh, and so their API was not just returning. So if you think of an API, like, hey, give me blog ID number one. Cool, here's the text, here's the title, here's any attachments that need to go on. If you think of an API like that, that's a pretty simplistic thing. This CMS that they were using, like, hey, give me the homepage content. Like, cool, here's a GUID for a menu that you need to go fetch from another API source. Here's a GUID for all the images that are going to load on the home page. You need to go get those images. Here's another GUID for the 15 pieces of content that are linked in the menu. Here's a GUID for the... And then it started going in, I mean, that's not bad enough. It started going into things like, here is the JSON clump of data for the T underscore hero underscore IMG component. I'm like, well, what if I want to build a site that doesn't have a T underscore hero underscore IMG component? What am I going to do then? Like, do I have to map that in the CMS? Do I have to translate that? So, yeah, uh, the information architecture sometimes needs to be a question of, hey, do we just need to re-architect the entire back end of the CMS too? Um, because you can really get yourself, if you're not careful, you can get yourself tied into knots around, um, you know, how the how the presentation layer and the information layer get woven together, uh, and it becomes very hard to, to disentangle them. Uh, in their case, they basically took a middle-of-the-road approach. They said, you know what? We are going to build a decoupled site now that uses this janky, nasty JSON dump, and we're going to figure out how it works, and hopefully the CMS provider, they've said that they're going to release a module in April, who knows if they will, that will clear this up. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. We're going to go forward anyway. And then next year, we're going to rewrite it all again and change out our CMS on the back end. Um, ah, gosh, I don't know if I can recommend that, but I don't also know if there was a better way of doing it. Uh, you know, so, yeah, that, that may not have been the most rosy example of a rousing success story for, for that, but uh, that specific thing, the information architecture really can 
<clears throat> really can put a, put a roadblock in your way. And sometimes you just have to power through it um, and understand that, look, as we're rebuilding, we're not just building a new front end for our site. We may also need to build a new back end for the site too, but we can't do both at the same time. Um, and for them, by choosing to go with the front end first, uh, because they felt that from a business perspective, that was the most pressing issue. Like, they're willing to deal with some nonsense on the dev side. Their customers were complaining that the site was way slow, outdated, uh, impossible to navigate. And they felt that for them, their business requirements where they get the front end fixed for the customers first, then they can turn around. Even if it cost them a little bit more in the long run, they think that the impact for their customers is worth having to kind of split it up in that way and take maybe a, a less than ideal approach. Any other questions? I feel like I see some faces where questions are brewing. Well, I mean, it's like I just want to pick your brain on that because you have a little more experience with decoupling with your clients or projects you worked on with them redoing the information architecture for the back end. How often do people actually realize? I mean, I personally think that that's really important now. It's like, if you're going to go decouple, do you want the most stable, reliable back-end architecture you could possibly have? Because if you do it right, you never have to change it. You'll just keep changing your front end, and if there's a, if, it's, if you're like, your, your organization wants to go to voice, that's a front end. You just keep improving the back-end. With, with your experience, how often can do people just get scared of that concept? People get very tied to their concept model. Uh, it's very antiquated. Of, like you brought up that example where there's content and there's a ton of configuration sitting inside that same space that makes no sense. Yeah, yeah. So how often do people actually really recognize this is an issue? The truth is, I think people actually do recognize it fairly frequently. I, maybe the other side of the coin to that question is how often are they willing to actually address that? Is is usually where it kind of breaks down. Um, I'm working right now with another prospect who did recognize that, that they had this wildly overcomplicated single source, actually a D9 site. So it's not like it's an old, you know, janky rundown backend. It's a D9 site, but they've, like you mentioned, they've been using it for some very creative purposes in the past. Um, and so they are actually part of their architecture, and they have a much more substantial dev team and they're bringing on some professional services from my company as well so it's it's a it's a fairly large effort but what they're looking to do is actually build an api gateway in between their front end and their back end systems and so this api gateway layer you can think of it as a middle tier between the presentation and, and the actual content layer will actually from different sources whether it's their home page or their shopping page or it's a sports team so you know their league mandated page um, this gateway will kind of translate requests that come in from the various different front ends into languages that the various back ends that they're using can understand. And then when those responses are received, they'll smooth them around. They're making heavy use of GraphQL, which is great because that lets you kind of define exactly what you want without all the cruft coming back from the back end. But I mean, some of their systems, they can't necessarily run GraphQL servers. So that's where this GraphQL gateway kind of sits in between. So they're taking the approach that they actually would rather have a middle tier rather than really like dive too deeply into that jumbled mess on the very bottom of the stack. They're providing something in the middle that does a little bit of the translation and you can almost think of it as business logic for, for content, right? Um, and it's, I mean, it's a two-year project. Mid, well, they think it's a two-year project. Um, it's probably three. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a big lift. But it's something that, you know, they see the power and the ability that that gives them to then kind of like progressively rotate out the worst of the worst underneath without making really any definitional changes to what's going on in that middle tier. Uh, they can just update that middle tier. They can even version their, their APIs. So like V1 calls get handled this way, V2 calls get handled this way. So it uh, really gives them a lot of power and a lot of flexibility. They're doing versioning in GraphQL. Like my experience with GraphQL, wow. Well, no experience. Research. I want to, that's a good way to put it. But my research. It's one. Technically, Facebook's like don't version it. You're supposed to just add to it. But they're definitely going in that direction that they're going to have different GraphQL version GraphQL endpoints to. No, their GraphQL will be a version, mm -hmm. and non GraphQL will be like v1. GraphQL will be like v2. So. If you think of it from the terms of like a URL perspective, they go slash API slash V1 slash 
right? That goes to their not their non GraphQL. The slash API slash v2 slash something that goes to their GraphQL portion. Um, so they're they're not versioning GraphQL because we would have waved them off of that real quick. Because you're right, Facebook definitely says do not do this. Um, and the whole point of GraphQL is that you don't need to. But um, they are having GraphQL as a version of their API and probably the final version. Yeah. And, and I'm sorry, I grew up geeking out on this one, but uh, with the GraphQL, because I, I actually wrote a blog post, and I'm just like, I feel like with that architecture, where you're like, okay, we're doing GraphQL. This is our canonical API. The resources to get that right are fairly intent. Like that's a project unto itself, outside of Drupal or anything. That's a schema that you you have to commit to. Yeah. Okay, so they're resourcing like that. Like yes. That yes. Like they team. they have. They have a local development agency that they are actually two that they're working with um, that will help them. We are going to help them. Their own devs are going to be working on it. So it's going to be you know three separate teams kind of pitching in on this project, and um, they are dedicating you know a lot of cycles and a lot of resources to building that layer because that for them is the beginning of basically unlocking the rest of their content. Um, I can. I think we have five minutes before the next session starts. I can take one more question, and then obviously I will be out and, you know, if anybody wants to, to grab me, but. Um, with your experience with vendors, so at the university, a lot of you know, faculty is concerned about cost. Have you seen vendors that would be willing to just do the decoupling part and not uh, really touch the back end? Yeah, we do. Edgeo does. Okay. <laughs> As a vendor, I can say yes. Um, yeah, so it really depends. I mean, some are more full stack. There's that term again. Some are more full stack than others in terms of what they will take on and what they won't. Um, the, with Edgeo, 30 second sales pitch, you know, we are pretty much dedicated to that front end piece, kind of only. Now, to Jacob's question over there earlier with you know the API gateway, we are also working with clients within a professional services capacity to lend some additional resources to help get that done, but primarily, um, we're there to support really just that decoupling portion of the front end and building out that application stack. And I know we're not alone. I mean, if you talk to some of our friends at Netlify or Vercel, they probably would have the same answers. Um, all right, so keep in touch. My details are there for LinkedIn, GitHub, email. Um, happy to continue any conversations online or over in the hallway. Um, but uh, I'd like to thank you for your time and uh, apologize for leaving you four minutes to hit the bathroom and get to your next session. But uh, appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you.